I'm Dr. Randy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center at Piedmont, Atlanta. I'm uh, pleased to be joined by three of my colleagues who make up our wonderful TAVR team, our transcatheter aortic valve team, and now our mitral transcatheter team. Chris Maduri, who's an interventional cardiologist, Vivek Rajagopal, who's also an inter interventional cardiologist, and Jim Counton, who's the cardiac surgeon on the team. And you guys have, have really done some, uh, have done a lot of really neat things, but we're going to talk a little bit about transcatheter mitral valve and valve. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about this particular patient. So this was, uh, Randy, thanks so much for introducing us here. Uh, this was a really a pleasant 83-year-old female who uh, was sent to us in our clinic who had really been struggling for a period of six months to a year with progressive heart failure. Uh, she's known to have an infarct-related myopathy with an EF 30 to 35 percent. And uh, another, another very relevant history to this is she had had a 29 millimeter uh, Carpenter Edward valve placed in 2004. And uh, it was thought that this actually may be uh, an ideology for worsening heart failure since the generation of this tissue valve. So this, this valve is about 11 years out. Exactly. Okay, and so, and, and so uh, Jim, I'm sure she was probably, so we know that we're gonna show some echoes. So her echoes uh, showed that the valve was both stenotic and regurgitant, but I'm sure you were seen, sent this patient to say, would you operate on it? What was your evaluation? Well, you know, she, she had had surgery before, so this would be a repeat sternotomy. She was quite frail. Her left ventricle was, was not normal. She had LV right. dysfunction. And combined with her age, uh, you know, we felt that her surgical risk would be, would be high pretty, risk. Pretty, pretty staggering. Yes. So, so you guys, uh, Vivek, when did, when did you guys start thinking about doing a, a valve and valve in, in somebody like this? Was this, you'd been thinking about it for a while or did she seem like a really, a, it was the best thing for her so she was an ideal candidate? We really had been thinking about it for some time, and you know, the thing that's profound is how frailty drives surgical risk, and right. the surgeons have known this for years. Her case, she was very, very frail. We knew that reduced sternotomy was going to entail an excessive risk, and we know that transcatheter technology now has really been refined and been applied in this scenario a number of times and we felt that we could be successful at this. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this and see. So her, I'm gonna show you her TE in the, OR, in the actual, in the cath lab. This uh, was very restricted bioprosthetic valve, severe mitral regurgitation and stenosis. Here's a, a transesophageal, mid-esophageal view at zero degrees, so a very stenotic looking uh, tissue prosthesis. And then you can see here that she's got both stenosis and regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. And interestingly, her mean gradient is cut off a little bit at the top of the screen, was uh, under general anesthesia and a blood pressure of about 90 was, was 11 uh, millimeters of mercury. And this is a 3D, which is really kind of cool. The left panels are from the left bottom is from the atrial surface and the right bottom is from the ventricular surface. These leaflets, Jim, you've seen a lot of these leaflets, haven't you, in the OR? This is sort of what it looks like, right, in these valves, is that correct? It is, the, the tissue type makes a difference too. The, uh, the, the uh, pericardial tissue valves tend to be stiffer and more stenotic, whereas the porcine valves, uh, we often see torn commissures, okay. so we see leakage of those valves. Okay, so this is, this is sort of what you would expect here. Yes. So Vivek, tell me a little bit, so, and Jim, you guys, or any of you, what are you doing here? This is the 4 -0. So one of the things in terms of placing the new valve is you use the old valve as a landmark. Okay. Um, when we start, we do scout films with yeah. fluoroscopy. And as you will see at the, on the later images, what we're going to do is trying to get the prosthesis in line so that when we put our new prosthesis in, we can very precisely place the transcatheter valve relative to the old valve. And in, in this view here, there's a hemostat in the right lower this guy right Corner. here, that's the hemostat. And right. we're, we haven't made any incisions So this yet. is on the outside of her chest. It is, we, we haven't made any incisions yet and we're, we're just marking the, the apex so that we can place a one to two inch incision over her left ventricular apex. And then, then this is the sewing ring uh, of the, uh, the current uh, degenerated, uh, deger degenerated valve. So you're, right. you're trying to look at a relatively straight approach into that? Yes, we, we, what we actually see there is the, the frame of the valve and, and uh, as Vivek mentioned, it, it makes for a very good marker, gives us good landmarks. Okay, so let's, let's go forward here into the next one. 
So this is this was uh, going back to the TE. So Jim, you've already this is a transgastric with the TE probe. So this is her left ventricle. The valve is up here. So you've come in at the apex and are looking like you're you guys. And I don't know whether Jim was doing this or which of you guys was doing it, but you're getting you look like you're lining up to cross the valve. And then we'll go back to the fluoro here. Exactly. So Chris, what's happening in this in this particular situation? So we're fortunate to have spoken beforehand with several centers with experience who explained to us that it can actually be quite challenging, conversely to maybe the transapical aortic approach, uh, to get the delivery system across the bioprocesses. So in order to kind of ease that, we actually put the sheath directly across the bioprocesses and then pull back sh the sheath with the processes across the valve already in order to ease the placement of the valve, really the coaxial and getting it across alone uh, in this angle. So that's what we're doing here is have the whole system across the valve. And for our viewers who are not as um, adept as you guys, so th is, this is the sheath that's across the valve, exactly. correct? So this is in the left atrium. Exactly. Right? So exactly you, you've right. come in. So when, then let's go forward here. So this is actually a, now back to the 3 dte Bottom left is the... Um, is the left atrial view, and this looks like it's probably the sheath coming across. So you're you're in position there. Exactly. Okay. Then let's go back to the fluoro images. So, what's happening here, Vivek? This looks like is this the crimped um, uh, sapien XT valve? Right. So that's the sapien XT valve. It is in the left atrium, and we are retracting the sheath. We're preparing to uh, be able to deliver it and deploy it. What we do, there's a series of steps where you unsheath the balloon uh, that is cr the, onto which this valve is crimped, right. and that's what we're doing right now. Okay, and you're and you're also yelling, "Get the TE probe out of there!" <laughs> <laughs> that's a usual. Uh, this is a can you get the? Can you get? Have, yes. Well, I know yes. frequently, frequently. Yes. Okay, so let's go forward. So, the, tell it. So you look like you pulled the still crimped valve yes. into the valve, right? So tell me what you're doing now. So now we have established a coplanar. That is a, an angle of fluoroscopy where we can really line up the new valve with the old valve. Okay. And we are going to align it so the new valve, the frame of that, is just past the, the top of the uh, frame of the old valve. So okay, so you're, looks like you might be pacing here, is that so right? Exactly. And that's in your position there, I see exactly what you were saying. Exactly. So as a vet comment, we're trying to achieve about 10% deployment across that process into the left atrium. And here we're rapidly pacing, as you can see compared to the last image, it stabilizes that prosthesis so we really know exactly where we're going to land. So we're pacing the patient 180 beats per minute. Uh, but again, you can see the stability is greatly improved in the, when we're pacing this quickly. Okay. And then uh, the next image. So tell us what you're doing here. Obviously, you've blown the balloon up and are deploying the valve, but what are you looking at? So, I mean, they're, they're really, the, the primary component is the depth that we're actually located at. So we want to be able to see that we are across the actual processes and into the left atrium to some degree. So I think we're at a good height here, about 5 to 10 percent across the processes there. The other key component is we want to achieve what we describe as somewhat of a conical deployment where we actually have a, a little bit of a flaring more in the ventricular side than the atrial side because we know that the ventricular pressures are higher and that this can help prevent there being any embolization in the left atrium by kind of flaring the valve right. okay. inward into okay. the ventricle Makes instead. Makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're going to come back to that in just a second. So, so this is the valve deployed and um, everything really looks, looks very good. Here's the 3 dte where you can see it. And there's a little bit of drop out there, but the valve looked really, really good. And then with a little bit of color, you've got just minimal amount of color coming around, probably between the two, you think, is that a little bit there, but nothing to speak of. It's very, very trivial. Okay. So, so, Jim, uh, or uh, Chris, or any of you, so obviously one of the advantages of tissue valves is that you don't need anticoagulation. One of the disadvantages is, is degeneration. Tell us a little bit about what you have here, Chris. So, I mean, Jim can obviously comment to this to a great degree as well, but what we typically see is, it, uh, in, depending, of course, on the aortic or mitral position, that in about 10 years, the 70 to 90 percent of the valves are free of any significant degeneration. But this continues to progress, and even at 15 years, 50 to 80 percent of valves can see some significant degeneration. And when we look at these patients, there's a, a good mix between it being primarily stenosis, right. regurgitation, or truly mixed picture disease. 
And as Jim can, has already alluded to, we know that reoperating on these patients carries significant increased morbidity and mortality. This is why people have really been pushing and looking at the transcatheter option being an effective technique to reduce the morbidity and mortality and still get a successful result. Jim, I, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, you know, these are the data that uh, we see with surgical valves. We, we don't have uh, the, the same length of time with the, the transcatheter valves, but I, I, I think what's interesting is the valves that we have available for transcatheter use use the same technology that our surgical valves use. So, uh, you know, the, the two first vendors uh, have surgical valves that have, have, been, yeah. have, you know, each have over 20 years of experience. So I, I think that's exciting and it gives, gives me confidence using these, these transcatheter valves. And Vivek, we've had, we've had some pretty good data come out recently about the transcatheter aortic valves that at five years plus they, they look very st structurally sound, isn't that correct? It's absolutely true. If you look at the function as defined by gradients, they appear to be remarkably stable. Um, or even other things like regurgitation, it really looks like this technology is quite durable. So, so this, Jim, this, this woman is uh, 83, very frail, bad ventricle, um, high operative risk. So the, the concept of, of here it took you guys, you know, some minutes, but, it, but a really good outcome it looked like uh, so far. How do you know what size valve to put in? I mean, because there's a host of valves out there with different sizes. Well, uh, there is. There's there's a very nice app by uh, Vinnie Buppet, who made all the measurements on the valves that uh, the tissue valves that we're going to run across in in uh, this particular time, and the. It's you something that you, we, you it's, actually just happen to have it there I on, do. Your, on your. I do. I do. And I, I don't think we could do this without these these. Uh, the, this information. It's pretty this, cool. I don't know if you can see. This, we can't. We is, won't hone in on it. This is the transmitral valve. So we we look up the manufacturer. We have to know the size. It gives us the true inside diameter, and it tells us uh, what size valve we need to use inside of this valve. So you looked up in her case. You looked up what valve she had, and then you you were able to get the true internal diameter, and then that would tell you what size. What size exactly. sapien valve you needed exactly. to put in there? Exactly. Okay, that's kind of cool. And then, Chris, this is what you were, or uh, Vivek, this is what you were talking about, where the mitral valve in this position is is a little different than the aortic in many ways, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. So again, as we kind of mentioned, we know that the mitral valve faces a higher closing pressure than the aortic valve does uh, because of the, the forces generating during systole. And because of that, there's an increased risk of embolization of a valve being placed in the mitral position. Sure. And so instead of a, a standard kind of more aortic approach where we kind of have the valve laying flat uh, and we want it to be kind of its more normal shape, here we tried to achieve, as you can see in the bottom right picture, a more conical deployment that will allow you then to, uh, by forming that, you're less likely to embolize yeah, because right. it's almost wedged into that mitral position instead. Well, that's, that's cool. So that's, and, and it, is this, uh, so this is, when you say you want to achieve a conical deployment, does that have to do with how you deploy it with the balloon or is it just, uh, it, or is it inherent in the valve? You understand what I'm saying? I think if you position it correctly with respect to the old prosthesis, you will achieve that. So you might imagine that if you were more 50-50, right. it, it would be more of a, of a rectangle Correct. versus this uh, cone. Okay, so, so one month out, we'll take a look at her. This is the transthoracic view, the apical four-chamber view. Uh, there's the valve, here's the left ventricle. LV function actually looks good, left atrium. Um, you see what looks like a lot of valve in there, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting for me as an echocardiographer to look at these valve and valves and see them because they look a little different. Uh, this is why you would say, gee, is there something, are you narrowing the LV output track, as I'll show you, you're not. And then with uh, mean gradient across, this was five, so you've got actually, so you've half the mean gradient. While it looks like there could be some uh, increased gradient in the LV outflow track, there really wasn't. So really a great outcome. Do you, you know, what's, where do we stand um, worldwide now with the experience of these valve and valves? Is, experience is, is limited but looking very promising? I, I think so. We were commenting earlier, I think looking at there's a, a nice registry, the global valve and valve registry. And, 
Uh, their last report, uh, you know, in September of 2014, showed that there was uh, just under uh, 200 uh, valve and valve procedures done either in the tricuspid or mitral position. I'm assuming, obviously, these numbers are continuing to expand. Right, right. I think the early data has been relatively promising. Fortunately, we have a lot of bright people who are tracking these things and looking at the more appropriate valve types to use, some different techniques and tricks for deployment that I think will help to guide us not only are these the best things, but also technical aspects that will continue to improve the outcomes of this technology as well. Jim and Vivek, is this going to be a transapical approach predominantly as we, for mitral valve and valve and then as we transition into transcatheter mitral valve replacements? You know, it's, it's very much of a straight shot from a transapical approach. And your positioning, your ability to get to the valve, your ability to precisely place the valve where you want to place it is very much facilitated by a transapical approach. Now, this is not only true for the mitral valve and valve, but future transcatheter mitral prostheses right. for native That's mitral right. disease, yeah. Yeah. it's going to be, at least initially, a predominantly a transapical approach. And I, I think the other advantage that gives us is if we need to do something to the aortic valve, uh, the aortic valve is easily accessed transapically yeah. also. So you're going to do two valves? We could. We could. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> is that right? Well, you, the excellent outcome in this, and it's very, very exciting. You. You help this patient who, as you're right, Jim, this would have been a very difficult uh, surgical recovery for this woman, high risk. So you guys did a, did a great go job continuing to push the, push the frontiers here. And I think um, it, you know, it's a very, very exciting time in Valvier technology. Thanks, thanks for joining us. And thank you for joining us. We hope you'll come back. We'll have more interesting developments.